Hi, welcome to another episode of Talking with Docs. I'm Dr. Brad Winnie. And I'm Dr. Paul Zalazel. Say, Paul, we're going back to school. Okay, Rodney Dangerfield. We're going to do statistics with docs today. Talking with docs about statistics. Yeah, so nowadays more than ever, the internet provides us with yeah. access to so much medical and scientific information. Tons of it. Which Some of it has jargon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jargon that is not familiar to sometimes us and even to other people. So yep. what we're going to talk about today is some really important, commonly used terms that talk about the nature of medical treatment and how it impacts outcomes. And we want you to get your medical information from actual studies. Don't be afraid to pick yes. up, um, you know, like New Facebook. England. No, oh. no, no, oh. no, that's what Twitter. I'm talking about. No, Not I'm Twitter. talking about the medical journals, New okay. England Journal of Medicine, okay. British Medical Journal. JAMA. I like to read JAMA in my pajamas, okay? <laughs> Some articles put you right to sleep, but other ones have like interesting points. Yeah. And especially nowadays, especially with all the COVID science out there, yep. don't get your science from mainstream media. No. Okay, mainstream media, I'd hate to be mainstream media. No, they're hated your on. Your hands are like tied. Yep. You're, 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 what you can say is often not what you want to say. Plus, you got to have a story, too. Yeah. You want to you yeah. have something that teases people to read or to watch or whatever. Don't get your science from there. Try okay. reading some medical journals. To do so, we're going to give you some statistical basics. Okay. Real basics. Okay, so we're first going to talk about risk reduction. And this okay. is a really common theme, particularly recently in some of the videos we've done when we mm -hmm. talk about mm -hmm. cholesterol medications mm -hmm. or medications effect on whatever someone is measuring or that it's called an outcome. Mm -hmm. So that could be a blood test, it could be an adverse event like a heart attack or a stroke. There's lots of different outcomes. So risk reduction. So there are two main ones. There's absolute risk reduction and relative risk reduction. Now, Paul, what's the difference? Well, relative risk reduction means is this going to prevent my cousin from catching this disease? That is not true. Not true. Just joking. So, so like Brad said, you have a study that looks at a treatment and how, how that treatment affects the outcome. And we call the risk of developing that outcome, if it's a bad thing, uh, that's your risk. Your absolute risk reduction is what percentage reduction are you seeing in that disease happening right okay so if you get a treatment so say for example we're gonna use an example uh, uh, can I oh, use you, an example yeah sure I got a great study okay this here we go study I've been dying to do. so and this has been done study? no it's never been done okay let I, as you know I'm always trying to find a medical benefit to the chicken wing eating chicken wings okay sure. so my hypothesis is that if you eat chicken wings it'll reduce your incidence of chicken pox Okay. okay, this is our hypothetical study. Okay, so let's say we take for, for the example of what we're talking about today, the risk reduction, let's take, we have a study with 2,000 people in it, okay? okay. 1,000 people is the control group, yep. the other 1,000 people represent the treatment group, okay. and the treatment is to eat chicken wings once a week. Okay. And, we're, and the outcome we're measuring is the incidence of chicken pox. Okay. Okay, this is totally hypothetical, chicken wings don't prevent chicken pox. Okay. So, the results here to show that, I suspect. <laughs> well, let's see. So in your control group, let's say, I can give you the numbers and you tell me the absolute risk reduction okay. and relative risk reduction. So in my control group, 1,000 people uh, didn't eat chicken wings and one in 1,000 got chicken pox. Okay. Sorry, two in 1,000. Two in 1,000 got chicken pox. Two in 1,000 of the control group got chicken pox. Okay. In my treatment group, right. they ate chicken wings. Doesn't yes. matter, mild, medium, hot, honey, garlic. Dry rub. I'm getting hungry. You realize we're going to be accused that we're funded by big chicken. <laughs> it could be. We would actually probably by beef. Yeah. Or chicken. <laughs> so uh, in that thousand, one in a thousand. Okay. Got chicken. So the people who weren't treated didn't uh, eat the chicken wings. Two in a thousand. Them. Okay. So. So here's the thing. So the difference between absolute and relative risk reduction. So the absolute reduction is two to one in a thousand people. So one. In 1,000 people, that's the reduction. So one person less got it yeah. in a total of 1,000 people yeah, that were treated. Yeah, so that is 0.1%. Yes. So the absolute risk reduction by eating the chicken is 0.1%. Right. So but you it, might say, forget it, what, that doesn't work. Right, but if I'm trying to sell you a chicken wing, I'm like, well, actually, if you look at the study closer, the relative risk reduction, when you compare them, is actually a 50% reduction. Right, because you went from two people getting it to one person getting it. So you say your relative risk reduction is 50%. And this is where sometimes the way the information is conveyed can be misleading. 
Whether it's intentional or not, that's up for debate. That's exactly it. So the absolute risk reduction was 0.1%. Sorry, chicken wing. Then you look at it and say, no, but the relative risk reduction was 50%. Well, that's a lot. Clearly, we reduced the risk of getting chicken pox by 50%. Let's eat some chicken Let's wings. Let's eat some chicken wings. And so the difference is if you're a pure scientific researcher, you should be presenting all that data, the yes. absolute risk and the relative risk. If you're a sales and marketing person, you don't care about the absolute risk, you're gonna present the relative risk because you wanna sell your product. The problem is when your scientific writers come in and they say that, um, oh, oh, the relative risk is 50% and they put that in their paper and not the absolute risk and they start acting a bit like sales and marketing guys right. or your sales and marketing guys are trying to present you scientific data and they're thinking they're scientists. It's when that sort of gray area occurs. Right, and one, and one other uh, stat or one other term that kind of combines the two is something called the number needed to treat. So NTT. this also addresses NNT. the yeah, NTT, NNT, N -N -N -T. N -N -T. addresses the, the incidence or how common of a problem this is. So if something is really, really uncommon, obviously it's really hard to lower the risk of getting that. If one in a million people get something, it's really hard to reduce the risk of getting that. Mm -hmm. Whereas if something's really, really common, sometimes a smaller intervention can have a bigger effect. So the way that you figure that out is you use a combination of um, the absolute risk and the number that have it. So for Paul's chicken wing example, a thousand people were involved in the study. Two people had it in the control group, one person had it in the treatment group. So one person less than a thousand. So the number needed to treat in order to reduce one case of chickenpox is actually a thousand. Whereas for example, if say 500 of a thousand people got chickenpox in the non-treatment group and 250 people got it in the chicken wing group. So the relative risk reduction is still 50%, 500 to 250, but the number needed to treat would actually only be four because you're reducing cases, 250 cases per thousand. So 1,000 is divided by the 250 and you get the number of four. So then you're like, well now, you know, we only have to treat four people with chicken wings to save one case of chicken pox, whereas before we had to treat a thousand of them. And this is a very common thing with medication, particularly in preventative medicine. How many people do you have to give medicine to to prevent, say, one heart attack or one case of diabetes or one case of cancer? And this all guides uh, particularly preventative guidelines for governments. That's right. So the number needed to treat, or the NNT, uh, the lower the number, the better. Okay. Right. If you're if you're that medication, because then you you're you're going to have a good effect right. with less doses distributed. And the NNT is very closely related to the absolute risk reduction. Right. Not the relative risk reduction. So the take home message is beware of relative risk reduction when the number is really high. You want to dig a little bit deeper and find out the absolute risk reduction because that's going to help guide decision making that for you as well as for your family doctor. Like we've talked about for all types of medication, medical treatment, sit down and say, listen, why do you think I should take this? What are the associated risks? Right. What is the potential benefits? And then make a decision together. Okay. And for those of you that stuck it out this far, a couple other things. We'll yes. give you some bonus terms. Bonus terms. Confidence intervals. Okay. That is a status statistical method where uh, you apply it to your results uh, that uh, suggest whether or not your results are due to chance or not. Right. And usually we set these confidence intervals at 95%. So you want to be 95% sure that the results that you're presenting are not due to random chance and are actually due to the effect. Okay. Uh, and so that's, but that means 5%, it could be chance. That's right. why it's important to see this study repeated by different institutions, guys at Harvard, people at John Hopkins, uh, people at Caltech, people where, everywhere are, are doing the studies and you want to see similar results yeah. to make sure it's not just due to chance because right. your confidence intervals are usually set around 95%. Then the two other things, meta-analysis. And systematic review. Right. So sometimes when you have a study, so say you have a thousand people in a study and you find some significant event or outcome, but because of this 5% rule, ideally the best studies are really well-run studies like randomized controlled trials that have lots and lots of people that are followed for long, long periods of time. Sometimes this is not practical for financial reasons, for logistical reasons, for lots of different reasons. So sometimes what a meta-analysis will do is they'll look through all of the literature, find a bunch of studies that are similar, and then have a look at similar outcomes done in a similar way, and then pool their results. So if you have 10 studies that have 1,000 people, now all of a sudden you have 10,000 people, which gives it what's called more power. So it increases the chances that your results are real, 
Um, and sometimes you can make more uh, broad conclusions because right. of it. So systematic review, you go through the literature and find all the studies and determine if it's a good study or not. Like that's someone's the job, result, right? to go through, I'll pour yeah. through all these papers. Meta-analysis, you take the data, if you can extract the data from all these studies, pull it together and then see what the results show. And that's a nice lead in for our next video because we're gonna review a meta-analysis that was done in JAMA this year, 2022 that was looking at the absolute and relative risk reduction of cholesterol by statins. It's a hornet's nest, I've heard. It really is a hornet's nest. All right. Okay, so that concludes Statistics with Docs. So if you like this video, please like it, subscribe to our channel. And remember, you are in charge of your own health. We'll see you next time.